morning. Good morning. Can I ask you to open up your Bibles, please, to 2 Kings chapter 8. We're looking at verses 1 through 6. Verses 1 through 6. And Juan is correct. I'm going to be talking about God's perfect timing today. And I love that psalm. Matter of fact, Juan, we, you need to teach it to us at 11 o'clock, giving you an assignment there. That was wonderful and perfect fit with the message this morning. So anyway, I want to talk about that perfect timing of God. So very simple message again this week, just straightforward. In 1978, there was a couple that moved here from Zambia. Uh, Dr. Lungu and his wife, Lucy. They were very involved in the church and teaching uh, and ministry. I had heard the name through Kathy, our former secretary, and they'd actually been here one time to visit, but I didn't remember. I've met so many people who've come through the doors that used to be members of the church. Some of you will remember Noah, who lived with us for two and a half years. He was a graduate student here at UCD. He was in Zambia interviewing for a job there. He, we landed on Saturday afternoon, and he left Sunday night. So we had one day we were there together. So we met up on that Saturday night after we had flown for two days, but had dinner with him. And he was sharing with us that he had met a couple that used to be members of our church. Dr. Lungu was not part of the interview process, uh, but Noah met him there and in their conversation discovered they had a common connection, our church. So he arranged for us to get in contact and Dr. Uh, Lungu and his wife Lucy and Lisa and I went out for dinner and got to talk and I, we got to know him. Uh, just a very sweet couple. So talking about timing, I didn't know where they lived. I really didn't even know them. I knew the name because Kathy would talk about what a sweet couple they were. And they stay, we used to send out a, a newsletter and they asked to stay on that list. So I would see their name every month when those would go out. So I knew the name, but not the couple and never just really kind of stuck with me that they lived in Zambia and that's where we were going. God's timing is perfect. I could tell you, and I really struggle with how many stories I could tell you of how God had been perfect in his timing. Some of you, a few of you, have been around long enough to know the story of Chase. When he was born, we were told he would not live. When he came home, he was still connected to machines and was on isolation for 18 months. When we came to this church at that time, there were five nurses and three medical students in the church. And they all loved to come and take care of Chase. The medical students, it was kind of like a laboratory for them, uh, learning hands-on experience. And they were wonderful about helping uh, me with Chase. We have a few retired nurses in the church now. We have one um, doctor in the church right now. But at that time, we needed a lot of help. And God had that perfect timing. Again, I could tell you story after story of how God always shows up on time. So let's look at another example in history. And again, like I said, a very simple message, but a reminder that he's never late. We may think he's running late because he's not on our schedule, but he is never late. So we're going to pick this up, 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 1. And God's word reads this way. Now, Elisha had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life, go away with your family and stay for a while wherever you can because the Lord has decreed a famine in the land that will last seven years. The woman proceeded to do as the man of God said. She and her family went away and stayed in the land of the Philistines seven years years. At the end of seven years, she came back from the land of the Philistines and went to the king to beg for her house and land. The king was talking to Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, and had said, tell me about all the great things Elisha has done. 
just as Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life, the woman whose son Elisha had brought back to life came to beg the king for her house and land. Gehazi said, this is the woman, my lord king, and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. The king asked the woman about it, and she told him. Then he assigned an official to her case and said to him, Give back everything that belonged to her, including all the income from her land, from the day she left the country until now. Heavenly Father, a simple and forgotten story that doesn't have deep theology in it, but a very clear, important message that we need to hear and trust. You are always on time. Help us to understand that and to live into that truth. Amen. Amen. So it's pretty simple to start with. What did Elijah tell the Shunammite woman to do? To leave. Get your family and leave the country. Now, everything was just fine in Samaria at the time. But he said, there's going to be a famine. The Lord has told me there's going to be a famine. You need to leave. So we see that God's timing is perfect in this. He warns the Shunammite lady. Well, who is she? Well, if you back up to chapter 4, you will see she is a lady who showed hospitality to Elijah. She had her husband build a little room on the top of their house. So when he came to town, he could stay. She fed him. She was an older lady who had no son, a regular story within the history of Israel. And Elijah prayed for her. She gave birth. Then at some time, her son died. Uh, we think maybe like of a heat stroke or something out in the field. But Elijah restored him to life through the power of God. So they had a relationship. So she knew this man and trusted him. And so when he said, leave, when everything around you looks just fine, she left. She left. She didn't question. She didn't argue. And she didn't delay. What would have happened if she would have delayed leaving until the famine had happened? I don't know, but everybody else would have probably been leaving. And finding a place to live, it would be like going to the airport uh, this week and say, I want to buy a ticket <laughs> on one of the busiest flying days. They're going to say, sorry, you're a little late. We don't have anything. Or they're going to charge you a lot of money. The Shunammite woman proceeded to leave as soon as Elijah told her to leave. She obeyed, and we see the perfect timing of God. She obeyed him because she had a relationship. She trusted him. She had seen God use him to bless her with a son, to raise him from the dead. She had history. My friends, we have history with God. Amen. We have it written down in the Bible that he has never been late once. I have history with God in my life again and again, how he's always had perfect timing. Perfect timing. We can just look at one more recent history. I'm planning our senior adult outings. And I go on the website to look to see what um, musicals might be appropriate for our senior adults here in Davis. And when I click on it, there's a little line that says auditions. And I'm crazy enough to try. On the other end, all the way up in Rockland, Emily is saying, Mom, I want to get involved now in adult theater since I am older, and I've always wanted to be in Hunchback of Notre Dame. Just happened that she does research for that musical and finds that it's happening where? Here in Davis. And she gets her wonderful sweet mom to drive her here every day for rehearsal. Oh my. And the rest is history. God's timing is perfect. We kind of compared stories to see. We got kind of excited thinking because we both had worked in children's camps at Alta. We thought, we've been close to each other and never met. Didn't know what God had planned. Then we found out it's, there's two camps in Alta. 
but they're run by brothers, I think, right? So we were getting close, but not until that perfect timing. God is never late. So let's continue. Pretty simple here. What problem did she discover when she came back? What was that? Yeah, somebody had taken her house and land. We don't know who, if it was the king himself or if it was a relative who had claimed it or, or a neighbor. We don't know. But she had been gone for seven years and somebody had taken up her house. Maybe somebody just, as we call it, uh, squatted in her house and they were claiming it as their own. We don't know. But her house and her land was occupied. So she goes to the king to ask for help. You notice that she comes back at the end of seven years. At first, when I was reading through that, how did she know that? Well, duh, if you go back and read, Elijah told her the famine would last how long? Seven years. So again, we see her trusting God. She comes back. Had she heard that things were better? It just got better in chapter seven. I don't know how long between seven and eight. It's more than just the little gap in your Bible, maybe. But she shows up after the famine had ended. Again, that perfect timing. But look at what happens. What was amazing is that she shows up to ask the king for help exactly, not before and not after when he could have forgotten the story. <clears throat> we don't know exactly um, why the king was asking Gehazi to tell him about Elijah. Maybe they were <clears throat> meeting for the first time. But he says, I want to hear about this mighty man of God. Can you tell me some of the stories of what God did through him? And so Gehazi is going through all of these stories of what Elijah did with the power of God. And while he is telling the story about how Elijah had raised this lady's son from the dead, in that specific story, she shows up. Now, many people say, well, that's just a coincidence. I'm sorry, I don't think coincidences happen that specifically and perfectly without somebody in control. God orchestrated that meeting. God's sovereignty made sure that while the king was curious about what Elijah had done, that this woman shows up at the specific time have you ever had that happen? You're telling somebody a story, and then somebody you're talking about, boom, they show up. I have an issue. It's not a very nice story I'm telling about them sometimes. Uh, and you're like, ooh, you know? You ever done that? Been talking about somebody, and they walk up behind you? <laughs> I kind of think that's God's perfect timing, too, to humble you about gossip. It should teach you gossip is wrong. Well, here... God is teaching us, if we trust him, if we obey him, his timing is perfect. Again, what was dependent on this was that the woman was obedient to God. She had to leave when God said there's going to be a famine to take care of her family. And she left in obedience. She had to come back when the famine was ended. She obeyed God. He told her, leave for seven years. She comes back. She had to show up at the right time. And you see what happened? The king is so impressed right in the middle of him learning about what Elijah had done for this woman, of how she had taken care of Elijah, how Elijah had promised her a son, and he was born in her old age, and then he died, but Elijah brought him back to life. That's a pretty cool story. And now you get to meet her. I grew up learning about Lottie Moon, uh, a missionary to China, who sacrificed so much. She did a lot there. She was very bold and would confront people there. She started a, a girls' school because girls were not allowed to be educated. And she confronted the government, confronted the culture. She also fought for the unbinding of the feet of women in China. But she shared the gospel. And she died taking care of other people. So I grew up with Lottie Moon being one of my heroes of the faith. So when I got to go to China, I got to go see one of the girls' schools. 
It was pretty much in shambles, falling down, but I still got to be there and see one of her first girls' schools. I got to go to her church. I got to sit in a pew that maybe she had sat in. I got to go see her home. And most people are like, so? But it was to me just so cool to be able to be in this area where this wonderful servant of God had lived and served and worked. Can you imagine the king when he's getting to hear about this story and he gets to meet the very person that God had done the miracle for? He was impressed. And look at the results when she said, um, could you help me get my house and land back? He didn't say, I don't have time for you. I am too busy. That's not important. Why did you leave in the first place, woman? She didn't, her husband, we think, has died at this time because she shows up alone with her son. Women didn't get a lot of respect back then. But you see what God did? The king was impressed with the story and the activity of God. So he was ready to be receptive. And not only did he listen to her, but he appointed an official just for her and said, here, here's your public defender. He says, make sure not only does she get her house and land back, but notice what he promised, that any income that came from her land. Now, we don't know. She may have had fig trees growing on it. She may have had some sheep in a pasture. We don't know. But this land was used for farming. And he's saying anything anybody earned off of your land, you get that money. Now, I don't know if it came from the king or from the person who wrongly took the land. We don't know that. But we know that God blessed this woman once again because of her obedience and because of his perfect timing. What does this tell us about God? God is sovereign over time. He is never late. But we got to show up on time. We have to show up on time. Airlines pride themselves in on-time departures and arrivals. It's a big thing. I did learn that if they pull out from the gate, <laughs> they don't have to get in the air to be on time. If they backed out of the gate... That's considered on time. And I will tell you, if you're not there when they're backing out of the gate, they don't come back to get you because that messes up their own time. It's your responsibility. And I've heard people that have missed a plane at a gate next to where I'm waiting. They go, well, the traffic was bad. Well, you kind of know if you're in New York that the traffic is going to be bad. You better leave a little bit earlier. Or I overslept. Well, if you know that's a problem and you're waking up early, you set two alarms. Put one across the room where you've got to get up. We, we just want to blame everybody else for us not showing up on time. God is going to be in perfect time, but you're going to have to be obedient to meet him. If you want to be blessed, if you want him to take care of you, we've got to trust him. Like that first song, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. My friends, I do not know what's going to be happening it seems like our world is just deteriorating morally, deteriorating uh, economically, deteriorating in so many ways that, yes, I think it could be soon that Jesus is coming back. I don't know, though. It could be another thousand years because pastors before me have said, it's getting close, it's almost time, the world is getting worse. But I will tell you this, God will show up at the perfect time. Amen. He won't be late. He won't be early. And if we're obedient, we'll be blessed. Look at Galatians 4.4. 4. You may think, why did we read this earlier? But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. When the time had fully come, when the perfect time, not before and not after. Now, many people have tried to figure out what made that the perfect time. They've got a lot of guesses. I don't know. Some of them sound pretty cool, pretty educated guesses, but they're guesses. But what I know is Jesus came at the exact time God knew he needed to show up, not early and not late. Thank you, Lord. Look at Mark 1.15. Jesus says, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. 
My friends, now is when we need to be saved. Now is when we need to be encouraging people to accept him. Now is the perfect time. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, the last part of verse 2. I tell you, now is a time of God's favor. Now is a day of salvation. The perfect time to be saved is today. The perfect time to share the gospel with somebody is today. Because we have no promise of tomorrow. It could be something as huge as the second coming of Jesus Christ. It may be that they, they die in an accident. We don't know. But I can tell you this, God's timing is always perfect. And he's been saying, today is the day to be saved. And if that's true, then today is the day for us to share the gospel with those who do not know Jesus Christ yet. Not tomorrow, not next week, not when it's convenient, not when we wait for them to ask us, but today. How might this affect our obedience to God? It needs to get us off our... And on our feet and realize we need to obey him now. Don't delay. Don't procrastinate. Because he's a God of perfect timing. If you're worried, it feels like he's not answering your prayers. He's forgotten you. He's not listening. Come back to the truth of this. He's never late. I imagine those seven years were long seven years. During that time, her husband dies. We don't know when during those seven years. She's struggling in a foreign land, a widow where women are not respected. I can imagine those questions. Is God ever going to end this famine? Clicking off her calendar. Waiting. But you notice, it didn't say she shows up eight years later. She shows up seven years later. She comes back at the exact time God needed her to show up. Now, we don't know that God said, today is the day you go. It just says, after seven years. But I believe if God had directed her to leave, God had blessed her in these ways, and God got her there, that there was some prompting from the Holy Spirit you go today to ask the king for your house and land. We've got to listen, my friends. We've got to obey. It's that simple. God is never late. And he is sovereign over time. So the problem is not God. It's our obedience. Heavenly Father, such a simple message, but one of encouragement, that you would orchestrate for this widow this Shunammite, to show up at the exact time the king was learning about her. So he would have favor on her and not only give her back her house and land, but give her the income from the last seven years. You are an amazing God that is so gracious and loving and wants to bless us. But we don't listen we don't obey. We don't move out in a timely manner. We keep postponing, waiting, delaying. And all we need to do is step out in faith and obey you now and be in agreement with your perfect timing so we're blessed. Help us to see that. Help us to live into that faith, to trust you, and obey as soon as you tell us to obey. Amen. Amen. Hey, I know all of you here. So I know you've accepted the Lord as your Savior. So I don't know what he is doing. But it is my belief that we still give an invitation. Today it doesn't need to be an invitation to accept him as your Savior. But an invitation to pray. Maybe there's something you're being impatient with. That you are ready for God to move now. And you just need somebody to pray with you that you can wait on his perfect timing and trust him that he will show up at the right time. Maybe God has told you he's showing up 
and your struggle is with that stepping out in faith and obedience, would you come? Let us pray with you that you can have that faith and trust to step out in obedience now. I don't know what he is doing, but I know that my God is not dependent on my ability to preach. His Holy Spirit is at work because his Holy Spirit loves you. And we want to pray with you to help you to understand that movement of the Holy Spirit, to help support you in responding to him. That's what an invitation is for. An invitation is to know you have family that stands with you. So let's stand. And if you have need of somebody praying with you, would you come to the front as we sing together, um, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus.